going to talk about math and graphic organizers today. I'm Chris Wooden, and I'm from Landmark School. So Landmark School is uh, located on the north shore of Boston in Massachusetts. Um, and when you go to the IDA, they make you give you this financial disclosure. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of proud that I've got a job <laughs> getting paid, and I wrote a book, and you can buy it. Not here, but everything you're going to see here, you can get for free on a website, which is coming up. Here it is. So if you go to this website, woodenmath.com, it looks basically like what you see on the screen. You will get the key to all types of free materials. If you go to workshop topics, and today's workshop, so if you go down toward the bottom, you will see the course you're going to see today. And at the bottom of that, you can see all types of things that you can download for free, including <clears throat> what you have right now. That's that download right there, as well as many other graphic organizers. I've got one little disclaimer here, and that's I want you to use this stuff. I want you to print it out, give it to the kids. All I'm asking for you to do is please don't repost it to the Internet because I'm constantly making positive changes to this, and if you post it somewhere, I can't have access to fix that or change it. So it's fine to share a link saying go ahead, get this free stuff. I want you to use it. Feel free to use it with the kids for free. That's what it's there for. Just don't put it back on the Internet. Okay. All right, some of my work, if you want to read about it in depth, you can go to Sally Shaywitz's website, uh, Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, and read about it there. Um, you'll also see throughout my presentation and these handouts, these QR codes, these big squares like you might see on your Amazon package. Um, if you look at your IDA app that you all should have downloaded for the conference, there's a QR code scanner on that. So if you have a smartphone, you click on that app, and you, it'll say, can I use your camera? And you say yes. And then you just aim your phone or your iPod or whatever you got, iPad, at uh, that QR code to your camera, and something will come up. So on here, that article will come up. On your handouts, a movie will come up to show you how to use that worksheet. All right. So I use this for a lot of different things, one of the most productive things I use it for is, say I'm working through a, a problem with a kid and they can do the math at home, uh, they can do it at school with me with that support, but then they go home and they kind of forget what they're doing and they need an example. Um, so what I do is I, uh, I have them work through the, uh, the actual problem that they have trouble with on an iPad with a stylus. It records it through an app called Explain Everything. It makes a little movie that generates one of these codes, and I can print that and put it right next to their homework problem. Do you see what I mean? So they're home. They're like, oh, I can't remember how to do long division. They scan this, and there's them working through the problem. Do you see? So it's very powerful because they can see themselves do it. It's not like going to Khan Academy where it's somebody else doing it. They're doing it, and it's their voice. All right, so it's about graphic organizers. It wouldn't be very good if I didn't organize the the class based with a graphic organizer. So this is the hour that we have. And you can see uh, basically our agenda and when everything's going to happen. I do this in a class, and I'll show you that later in terms of showing the kids what skills we're going to cover during the class and how long it's going to take. So in the scope of this, that's your basic minute hand. And you see as we go through the hour here, those are the topics we're going to hit and when you're going to hit them. So you get an appreciation for what you've done, how much time that's taken, what's coming up next, and where you are within that hour. So you can start planning and figuring out how long things have taken and how much time you still have left. So if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a little clock icon, and that's where we are right now at the first uh, five or so minutes of this presentation, and we're going to talk about the introduction and rationale behind why we have these. So graphic organizer is basically, it's a visual device, but it's used to communicate. Um, it has visual symbols, uh, and, and it's meant to express knowledge, concepts, thoughts, ideas, and means, uh, most importantly, the relationships between them. So it allows you to collect, filter, create, and communicate information. Um, 
but really the most important thing is that they support the children that have working memory or executive function or language-based processes, uh, issues with those different dynamics. So these support all of those different functions. So here we're looking at a division problem. If you look at that icon right there, down at the bottom where you see the finger pointing, if they had that right next to the problem, I'm assuming this is a right-hander, so we'll put it on the left, they can track on that graphic organizers of steps. So this is, these are the steps along division. Compare, divide, multiply, subtract, check, subtract, and bring down. They track along as they do it, and the next step they're going to have to do is subtraction. Do you see? So they can keep their place within the context of that problem. See what they've done and see what they still have to do. So what I want you to realize is these graphic organizers are visual in nature. Um, they provide, as all pictures do, a lot of information, but you need language to sequence it. So pictures are not sequenced. Pictures give you all the information all the time. All the information is simultaneously present. So if you were to picture a pine tree up there, you can focus in and touch at the end of a branch and work your way in, but what you're doing then is you're labeling things with language. Language is sequential. Most math is sequential. Do you see? You need both. You need the picture of this thing. You also need language to help you sequence through the different events as you prioritize and order how you're going to manage that picture. So if we look on the left at that clock, you get a relational understanding of where you are within that graphic organizer. Do you see? You see the part within the whole. So using that clock, you say, well, it's almost 3. And the time might be 2.57. If you look at on the right, 2.57, you do use your eyes to look at that, but you're really processing that as language. Do you see? And what comes after 257 will 258. But do you see how you don't have a way to compare those two? So the graphic organizer is powerful in that it lets you compare. Without the ability to compare, you don't develop number sense. You don't understand where you are in a sequence in a process. Do you see? It's very important where most kids end up um, losing their train of thought doing a math process is, is that they can't see where their production step meshes with the whole of the entire process. So some diagrams are just better than others, just like that analog clock, if you can read it, is much more powerful than the digital clock if you want to be dynamic with it. So if you look at these pairs of, of, uh, of, of uh, of graphic organizers. Look at the red on the top. There's a bunch of red dots, and if you count them, there's five. Compare that to what's on the right, and there's more of them, but do you see how it's relatively hard to compare them than the blue? So if I look at the blue, I see that's five, yes? And can you see the five within the eight? So this eight, you see the eight, if you want to see the eight, it's there. And I see the five, and I see what's not part of it, and there, this is three bigger. Do you see? Now compare this red and this red. So this is beyond your digit span, so now you really have to count. And as you count, the problem with counting is when you go one, two, three, four, most kids aren't constructing an idea of four things. They're just keeping pace with, just like uh, they're saying the alphabet. Some of these kids think elemento is a letter. You know what I mean? Comes before P. All right, so... Here, you can't match this quantity within here. You see it's there, but you don't know how many more. So you're kind of going, how far is it from, from B to Q? It's hard. But here I see that 8. I see the 8 within the 12 here. And how far is it from the 12? Well, 2 and 2 more. It's 4 away. Do you see? So that's a much more powerful graphic organizer in that it allows comparison. And the smaller number is subordinate to the larger, but it has the same visual structure. So you can see where you are, what's there, what's not there, and then you use language to link those numbers together. So these are the icons that I came up with quite a long time ago. But do you see how when you draw them together, they make 10? More importantly, 
there's a concept called visual close. So here's that 8 again, and here's the 10 in the yellow box. Do you see what the 8's missing to make the 10? It's the 2. And so you can say, well, I see 8. If I had 2 more, I'd get 10. Or 8 plus 2 is 10. 10 minus 2 is 8. Do you see? Whereas if that was just a bunch of dots in a line, it wouldn't come to you. So the more consistent that the formats are and the familiarity and, and simplicity or elegance of these structures um, really makes it so they're what I call durable. They're able to go home with the kid. So all the plastic materials you have, all the manipulatives you have, that's great. They'll help the kid when they're there. If the images aren't stable, well, as soon as those plastic things and you go away, so do all those concepts. They don't have a way to lock that in their visual memory. So these things have to be, uh, they're called canonical figures. They have to be something that you're expecting to see and you already have the ability to see that whole. And if you have that, then you can start comparing and being able to be dynamic with the information. So as I alluded to earlier, language marks the linear sequence of processing that establishes a fact or procedure. So you need language to make a structure or a sentence or a fact. You can't say two words at the same time, so you need to order them, do you see? But a picture, you don't have to do that. You can have all the information there. So you need both of these ideas, the picture that holds all the information so that you uh, don't need as, as much working memory to manage it, and then you need language to be able to express as you toggle between figure and ground within these graphic organizers. Again, the picture is like a Polaroid. I'm dating myself, but you know what I mean? It's a picture. And what you really need to do is make this into a movie. You need to put the soundtrack onto it. Once you do that, then you can start using your inner voice to drive yourself through the next problem. So a lot of times, kids will get a completed example, and they'll say, well, I see it, but I don't know where to start. I don't know where the next step is, and I don't know how to how to make the process, because they don't have the language skills to go through it. Do you see? So oftentimes, I use gross motor therapies to force the kid to interact with these and synchronize those two processing modalities. So here's a quick example of how I might do that. Here's the first one. We're starting with this shape. Okay, make a six fact. Six equals? Six equals... Four plus two. Nice. So you see what he's able to do? He sees the picture of all the stuff. I give him a target to find. He sees that, sees what's not part of it, but then it drives the language so that that fact goes home bundled with that picture. So that kinesthesia of touching those things, that's what sequences everything. You can't touch everything at the same time. So the sequence that you lead them through to touch everything drives the language, and then the language goes home with the kid. Kind of cool, huh? So traditionally, you have visual processing and auditory processing. Well, that's reading, right? <laughs> you put look at stuff, and words come, and you express them. Um, but if you're going to write, that's motor processing. Traditionally, motor processing, either speaking or writing, that's at the end. That's how you know you're done, right? Something's gotten processed, and that's the last thing. I use motor processing to drive both the visual and the auditory. The visual selection of going from, from ground to figure, and also auditory processing in terms of expressing that relationship. Do you see what I mean? You can go both ways. So we want to use spatial processing and reasoning skills to look at that visual information. Then we sequence the steps with touch and movement as we verbalize that. If you do that, it's forcing the integration between visual and auditory processing so that you're able to sequence that picture that you have seen. Okay, I'm going to do a quick thing on just adding, subtracting, and getting an idea of number sense. We're going to go all the way to like slope and algebra. So. It's going to be quite a ride. You ready? Starts early. So I'm going to just start with these base 10 images. So if I'm looking at this, I'm not blaming this on IBM, but I'm a Mac guy, so it's a little different, okay? So bear with me. But if I'm looking at this, I see this shape. 
So I've got the visualization, but I'm going to trace it. So that evokes a motor response, right, that you can file away through motor memory. Can you copy that shape? Okay, yep. Can you draw the dot pattern? And then can you put that same dot pattern into a corresponding Arabic character? Okay, so do you see how I've linked all those different things? I give you one picture, and you can express it a lot of different ways. I'll show you this picture, and now go ahead and count it. But don't count that to forge the idea of cardinality. Look and see that it's three, and then count and make sure they're all there. One, two, three. Yep, it's three. That way you can predict. You see the pieces within the whole, and then you articulate them. <clears throat> all right, so there's some dots up there. I'm hoping you're seeing 10. Say 10. Bless your heart. Okay, so watch what happens. We're going to make a subtraction sentence. Some stuff went away. Can you see how to fill it back up? It's missing what shape, say square? Yeah, it's missing the square. And so that makes it so you're not counting. Do you see what I mean? But you can see uh, perhaps this six. Do you see the six? Okay, that's six. And to make 10, you're missing that square. And if you need a little processing time, you can have it because everybody's pictured a square before. And you're going to say 10 minus 4 is 6. Now, can you all see after you've done that how you want to close that again? You want to put the 4 back. So that's going to drive 6 plus 4 is 10. Do you see? So you start with the gestalt. You pull something out and the kids want to close it and put it back. And you're driving all kinds of language associated with that one picture. So again, I'm toggling between figure and ground. Right now, ground's everything, including that yellow rectangle. So I'm seeing six dots, and there's a big American six on there, right? So that's six. But if you start seeing pieces in there, in other words, start seeing a figure in there, do you see the top triangle in that six? And then there's some other stuff. But here I've got a gestalt. I see different pieces in it. And I can see a square in there. So you focus on the square and see what's not part of it. Do you see? And that's going to drive. It's all worth six, but how are you breaking it up? But again, whole to part, not part to whole. A lot of kids have a really hard time taking all the pieces and assembling something if they don't know what they're assembling. Do you see? So what's 13 plus 8? And they go, oh, God, right? I can't put all these pieces together. But if you have the thing already built, they can take it apart. In other words, if you give them all the pieces to a stapler and say, build this, well, maybe. But if you have a stapler and they take it apart, well, they'll probably put it together. There'll be some extra free parts. But <laughs> be more successful than doing it the other way. All right, and the last one would be, can you just figure out the top dot? Parse that out, and that's 6 minus 1 is 5, or 6 plus 1 is 5, yes? So for those pictures... Just with a little color coding, do you see how you can make all kinds of sentences based on six? So we get a really robust understanding of what's made, what's six made out of, and how do you, how can you de decompose it and recompose it? Is that making sense? All right. So, oops, let me back up here. So this is in uh, in your handouts. You'll notice up at the top there's a big QR code. And so there's a movie of a kid going through this, so you can see how to do it. So you can do that at your leisure. But as you're doing this, this is just a number line. I just want you to get an idea. Number line's a graphic organizer, but I want you to understand some confusion having to do with the number line. As the numbers get bigger, you go to the right, correct? Generally speaking, in the number line. Um, if you're thinking numbers like, okay, 1, and then 10, and then 1,000, where do the bigger numbers live, on the right or the left? I know. That's kind of strange, right? If you asked a kid to point to where big is, do you think they're going to point to the right or up? Well, they point up, you know? There's my big brother, there's my dad, there's the son. Big, right? So if you have a number line going up, there's some kind of semantic understanding that that's big, this is small, and I can navigate amongst that, and it makes sense. Whereas the number line going to the right and getting bigger, and the numbers get bigger as you write them down, they go to the left, is kind of overwhelming for some kids. For a lot of kids, it doesn't matter. For probably the kids that you're coming here to talk about, it matters. Right? So remember, it's not all about what's great for everybody. It's what's great for the individual. So as we look at this, 
Up at the top, it's just some cues to get your numbers in the right formation. There's a little star where you start the numbers. But if I were going to add 2 and 6, I'd go to the larger one and just add two extra dots to it. Do you see? And that makes the 8. And if perhaps I wanted to add 6 and 7, I'd go down toward the bottom, get the biggest one. Here's 7. And if I did 6 right underneath it, it would make 1, 10, 3, 1. 13. Do you see it? So in other words, they're able to picture each part of that 13. They see the, the 13 dots, a group of 10, and then three ones. They see the 110 in the Arabic number and the three ones, and they see how that's the same. And the 13's made out of a 7 and a 6. So all the information's there for them to take away and then put back. Instead of counting it, and when you count it, it's gone. All right, so I use, again, lots of manipulatives. This time I'm using Play-Doh. So again, all these videos you can watch. I'm going to keep going because you can watch them anytime you want. But anyway, you see how they're able to take pieces. Here's change. So what I did is I've got this coin mat. On the left you put dimes, on the right you put pennies. So now you can figure out change by looking at this. All right. So what I'm going to do is if you put a, a certain value down, so like something cost, oh, perhaps uh, 55 cents, you'd put five dimes on the right, five pennies on the right, and what's uh, five on the left and five pennies on the right. And you look at the top and that's the change, 45 cents. So what I've done is I've done the regrouping step for you. So nine dimes and ten pennies makes a dollar, right? So I'll show you quickly how this works. Okay, what we're going to do is learn how to make change today. We've got a template here. We've got dimes here. How many spaces for dimes do you see? Well, nine. So nine dimes would be worth what? Nine dimes would be worth 90 cents. Good. And over here we got a spot for 10 pennies. So what's this worth? That is worth uh, 10 cents. Good. And when you put 90 cents and 10 cents together, it makes? A dollar. A dollar. So we're going to make change from a dollar. So what I'd like for you to do is I want you to start out with the price of something being 35 cents. So put 35 cents on this template with the coins. which is equal to 30, and then I put five pennies in the pennies place, which is equal to five cents, and all together it was 35 cents. Great. Now we said that all these spaces represent a dollar. So 35 cents represents how much stuff is there. So all the spaces must represent the change. So just by looking at it, can you tell me 
what the change is going to be to make from a dollar? The change is going to be 65 cents. Good. I want you to write 65 cents underneath 35 cents. Great. Now add it together, and if you've done it right, you should get a dollar. So what did you just add? 5 plus 5 is 10 5 cents. 5 plus 5 is 10 cents, and then 3 plus 6 is 9 cents, plus 1 more is 10, and that equals a dollar. Nice job. All right, do you see it? So can you figure out what the change is? If that's what it costs, costs 72 cents, can you see what the change is going to be? 28 cents. So all you need eventually is if you can think, if you're looking at 72 cents and you want to find the change, what's the missing add end? How far is 7 away from 9? And I'm just sticking up two fingers on my left hand, do you see? And now I can, that's freeing up working memory, so I can say how far is 2 away from 10, and it's 8. So it's 28 cents. So kids can finally make change. You ever go to McDonald's and give them extra money and try to make the dollar and they freeze up and, okay. It's sad. The kids can't make change anymore. Okay. Here's a quick larger subtraction with regrouping problem. All right, Colin, we've got a big problem here. Tell me what you're doing. I have to subtract. Six. Okay, read that problem. Three hundred sixty-one minus twenty-nine. I have to start my ones place. They want me to take nine away from one. I can't do that, so I'm gonna have to regroup. Take that out. <coughs> regroup. I don't have six blocks anymore. I have five. Now I'm going to take away 9. It's going to be a 2. Tell me I'm going to take away 2. I'm going to have 3. And then it says don't take anything away from the 100, so it's going to stay as a 3. That's fantastic, man. Perfect. So that lets you go from uh, depletion to addition. So you can also add stuff and you make a 10 and that trades for a stick. Just a nice way to go through and uh, help that dynamic of shifting between 10 sticks and, and ones. But the whole idea is not counting things out, but seeing it all at once. So let's shift to multiplication. So I want you to show, I want to show you a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, we're going to start with some, some graphic organizers and then interact with them. So this is a relatively standard thing, the array and the area model. So. I'm going to show how this dovetails with fractions and percent. So that's the important part. So the amount to make one whole, that's how I look at the divisor. So here with crocs, right, it takes two to make a whole. And that's the number of pairs. So that's the number of crocs, right? So you can start saying three times two is six. That makes sense. So let's make it a little more abstract. So I don't have crocs, but I'm going to use an area model. Same deal, though, right? Three times two, six. And I can drive with those circles and the square, put the numbers in there, and the order doesn't matter because of commutative property, so we can do it both ways. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to put, add a little kinesthesia on here to link that together when it gets to be bigger. Oops. Okay, that's three once. That's three twice. Awesome. That makes six, yes? Yeah. Okay, you ready to do it for real? That one. Oh, yeah, I see it. Got it? That looks more like a fish. Okay, you ready? Get to it. All right, here we go. Three once, three twice. How many dots? Six. Beautiful. Three, two times is six. Okay, take fifth out. There you go. Go ahead, that's ready. See so if you can make the triangle where it's going up. Nice. Ready? I'm right, just going to do it twice. Ready? Three, one time. And three, two times. Oh, that's a nice six. Do you see it? Nice. All right. Three 
times two equals six. Seven times two equals fourteen. Her. Eight times two equals sixteen. See what I mean? So you can put all the pieces together, see uh, see the parts within the whole. For uh, different things, I used to use different graph and organizers. I definitely love the clock. A lot of kids can't read the analog clock. I found putting them in the center of it, that blue tarp is the clock. Do you see what I mean? I'm not giving them all 12 numbers, but I need to make them aware of where the 3, 6, 9, and 12 are. From there, every number is just one away from that. Again, they're getting a relational understanding. You can't overwhelm them with too much. You give them just enough so they can start navigating around. Um, over there in the, in this, oops, sorry, in this diagram, do you see where the red dot is? What number would be down there, say six? You know what I mean? Okay, so that's five times six is 30. So I'm giving you a positional cue of where that number is going to be. Do you see what I mean? That's the factor to get the 30. So I'm giving you the minutes here. You know these chunks are all chunks of five. And down here, if there was six, it would be 30. So that's six up here. And here's how you drive that. So we'll start with the 12 right at the top of the clock. And then we'll start filling in the numbers in our minds. This is your first time doing this, right? Yes. Okay. I want you to point to the three. Nice job. Point to the nine. Nice. Point to six. Perfect. Point to... Okay. I do first, then you're going to imitate it. Six. Where am I? Oh, 30. Three. Okay. Everybody have their hand in the middle? Excellent. Watch my finger. Great. And I'm going to go scooch down. Just one. Okay. Okay, let's see it. Where are you, Alden? Four. Okay. All the way down. Great. Watch my finger. Great. Okay. And where are you? Seven. Right in the center? Make a sentence there. You ready? 45 is five times, and we're writing five times. Okay, what's that position that you were at? Yeah, what was the position? Nine. Nice job. Say that whole sentence for me. 45 equals five times nine. Beautiful. 
Okay, fingers in the middle. That way. Good. What position is that, everybody? Good. Okay, look right down. It's 15 minutes. Can you guys make a sentence? 15 equals 5 times what? 3. Write it in. Oh. Beautiful. Nice job. Fingers to the center, drag straight down to the 30. What number's there, everybody? Six. Beautiful. Let's get your pencil. Let's get that fact in. 30 equals? Six. Five times? Five times? Six. Six. Nice job. Uh, five times three is 15, because the three is at the 15, the 15 is at three spot. Five times four, nine is forty-five. So in that one, did you notice he said four, and as soon as he motorically went that way, he said nine? Because it's in motor memory, and that's linked to it. So again, all this kinesthesia helps put all this stuff together. So a lot of people... Uh, have an agenda on the classroom, and I support that. That's what you should do, saying these are the skills we're going to do. I put my agenda now in a clock. I have basically an hour class. So instead of putting an agenda like warm-up, main focus, breaker, blah, 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 what I'll do is I'll say that's where we're starting. Maybe it's at 4.15. It's, it's a tutorial after school. But I could do the same thing in class. But I'll say we're going to start at 4.15, and these are the things we're going to do. Do you see what I mean? Now the kid basically has an idea of how much time has, has transpired throughout it. And all these things are available on the website. Just take them and it's good to go. All right? All right. I don't know about your specific states. Massachusetts has done away in terms of state testing. You can't bring a multiplication chart to the test anymore. All right? So what I'm able to do is have kids create not the whole multiplication chart, but an abbreviated chart for a fact family they might not know. And they take this with them, and I, if you look in the, uh, on that web page, you can see the approved graphic organizers I have for Massachusetts. So the state, state said the kids can, as long as they use them in class, they can take them to the state test. And this is one of them. So it's a ladder chart, um, and it'll let you create multiples for, like, perhaps a division problem. You need to know multiples of, of 31. Well, you don't want to memorize that, right? But if you have a quick way of making those, it's pretty helpful. I'm going to present the wooden ladder chart. It's a way for getting multiplication facts from difficult fact tables, like the sevens. There's seven days in a week, so I'm going to talk about weeks and days. One week plus one week, two weeks. Add the same complement of days. I get 14 days for two weeks, because two times seven is 14. It's an even number, so I'm pretty sure it's a two times factor. I'm going to add one week plus two weeks and get three. So I'll add the seven days plus the 14 days. I'll get 21. These digits, because it's a three times factor, should add to three, six, or nine. They add to three. So I'm pretty confident I'm right. All right, I'll add two weeks to three more weeks, and I'll get five weeks. Adding the days, I'll get 35. It ends in a 5. I think I'm right. 3 plus 5 is 8 weeks. Add this, I get 56. Now, I'd really like to know what 9 weeks would be. So I'll just one add that one more week. That's 7 days. 63. If these digits add to 9, which they do, I'm probably right. The big check is 7 10 times would be 70. So if I add nine weeks in one week, I should get 70 here because I get 10 weeks, and I do. So I can be pretty sure that all these facts are correct. Right? So it doesn't show you all the facts, but it gives you all the, all the pieces you need to build any fact you need. So it didn't give you four, but you know that if you have two and you add the other two, you'll get four. So again, in your handouts, there's a blank one here for you to try, and there's a movie right next to it to show you how to do it. So, again, 
what I encourage you to do, I'm going to show you lots of different things, but if you go to the landmark table or you see me around, you say, hey, show me that thing. That's what I live to do. So do that, all right? But you've got a chance to, to do this a couple of times. All right, so we're going on to division. And we're getting to be getting close to being done here. So I've got the different strategies to do it. We showed you the uh, that basic array or matrix diagram. And all I'm going to do is add this structure to it. And I'm just going to take away two lines. So I just turn that into division. All right, so if we start with all the stuff and then we parse it, divide it by how much it takes to make a whole, we get the number of whole things and that correlate. Now again, that picture is pretty powerful, but if you get the kid to interact with it, all right, so have them stand on the eight. And from there, what kind of a problem it's, is, is it going to be if you start with all the stuff? Well, it's division, yes? And the first motion you're going to go is to the left. Most kids are going to say two divided by eight because they're trying to read this like they would their name or something, right? So if you get them here and they have to go through it and they link their motor output with what they're seeing and what they're saying. So she's saying 8 divided by 2 is 4. Do you see? And that same gross motor motion is going to be evoked when she tries to do that same thing with her pencil on paper. Yes? So it's not just having the picture. You've got to interact with it. You've got to realize most of the kids that we teach that have the issues, you can overwhelm them quickly with language because they have nothing to do with it. So what you've got to do, you've got to train yourself to talk less and get your kid to teach, to, to talk more, right? So they've got to go through this and verbalize the steps that they're doing. That puts it into their internal language and you complete that phonological loop where they're describing the process and that's what they can evoke through episodic memory of doing this to help them drive through other problems. You can add the same... Uh, Structure to word problems. All right, I just want you to do a fact. Can you jump on the eight? Yeah. Okay, start by doing a fact starting with the eight. Eight divided by two equals four. Okay, now do another fact. Start with four. Four times two equals eight. Okay, now let's put some words to what you're saying. Look right down. I want you to stand on the eight and read what's there. Eight years. Okay, there are eight years. Okay, move to the left. Let's do a division word problem. It takes two years to make a whole rabbit. Okay, now ask the question. How many rabbits are there? Okay, answer your question. There are four rabbits. Okay, now let's see you do a multiplication story problem. Start with where you're standing, the four rabbits. Okay, now ask a question How about many all the stuff. Are all together? Are eight years. Nice job. Okay, so you put this into context, but again, having them go through it keeps their place within that visual structure. Again, here we are looking at that clock, but in terms of division, can you picture a, if I'm inside my clock right here? So my three's here, my nine's here, twelve's here. And if I said, what's 45 divided by 9? That's over here and it's 5, yes? Or 45 divided by 5 is going to be 9. So what's 46 divided by 5? Well, here's 45 and 46 would be one minute more. So it's going to be 9 and 1 fifth. Do you see? So that's what he's going to do right there. Again, I'm saving time. All these videos you can get on the website. Here's a big division sheet. Down the bottom, this is how I reverse engineer everything. The problem I want the kid to be able to do is 420 divided by 12. So you see I have the sequential steps there in iconic form. The eyeballs compare and then divide, multiply, subtract, check, subtraction, bring down. They can track through that as they do the steps. To be able to do that problem, you need to know multiple, multiples of 12. And you need to know that in multiplication format and division format. So that's why the ladder charts up there in the left, they need to do that first. The specific facts they're going to be able to use are going to be uh, 36 divided by 12 is 3, or 3 times 12 is 36. I need them to be able to express that. So I put two lines. They've got to write those two facts. 
The other thing is they have to be able to do subtraction. So the subtraction problems that are inside that, multi that division problem are over on the left. So if they can't do 42 minus 36 and get that correct, there's no hope for that, right? So I present it first. Make sure you can do all those pieces. So as a teacher, I do the problem, think of all the things they need, present that first, they do all those pieces, and then they put it together within this incredibly confusing multiplication procedure. Do you see? So I'm, again, I'm going to skip through this, but you see the steps. And then once they do all these steps, as soon as they get down to the division problem, it's easy because they've done all the, the specific steps beforehand. Now they just have to learn how to string them together. Okay. So let's do some fractions. This graphic organizer dovetails with that matrix multiplication and division graphic organizer. In other words, the divisor on the left usually is the denominator, the number to make a whole. So that's your denominator. So if I said something about one hoof, the neat thing about that language is when you think of a hoof, well, it's on an animal that has four legs, yes? So now we've got a fraction, one-fourth. And I've got one image that can carry you through that whole idea for the encoding part. It takes four to make a whole, and we're talking about one. So one eye is going to be one-half, yes? So again, one picture, but you've got to get language to be able to put it into this context. Four eyes would look like that. That means there's two people, right? All right, so here's a dog. This is how you can do equivalent fractions with that same idea. So I've got one picture, but you're going to make two different fractions with the same exact picture. You're just going to rename the fractions based on the denominator. So if you think of sides of the dog, well, inside the box there, there's one side out of two. That's one half. But if you rename it in terms of paws, it's two out of four. But we're talking about the exact same stuff. Do you see? That's what's so powerful about it. So then you layer on the procedural bit. If you look at that division sign right up here called the obelisk, if you look at it closely, it's really a fraction. Do you see? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of that as a fraction. And 6 divided by 2 looks like that. And as a division problem, it looks like that. Do you see the circles and the squares and how they all match together? So this is a pretty powerful graphic organizer. Given one of those three uh, ways to express six years, you can, uh, you can write it down three different ways. So if I said 6 divided by 2 or 6 halves or 6 divided by 2 as a division problem, those are three different ways to do it. And that will end up giving you your decimal equivalent down at the bottom. There's your fact up at the top. And there it is as a fraction. Most kids don't do well, don't do well in algebra, don't do well as soon as they hit rational expressions. They can do fine with integers, things like that. Eventually, algebra turns into a bunch of fractions, and that's when it explodes, because they don't have a good, durable way to manage fractions. So they end up not doing well in algebra. That's what sets them up for not doing well in high school and in college. Fractions and multiplication facts, two of the most important determinants of whether you're going to be okay at algebra and then be able to do okay at college. So this is where you put the time in, making sure it makes sense at that level. So fraction to decimal conversion takes four to make a whole, but you only have three. Do you see how you can turn that into the division problem? The bigger number doesn't always go inside. Do you see what I mean? So that's how you set it up. Percent and proportion. We're going to use these graphic organizers to link that fraction to percentage. So what I've got here is fractions can be represented as decimals or percentages. This is a, a program called Explain Everything. It costs, I think there's a free version or it might cost you three bucks. But what I'll do is I'll give this, it makes like a Khan Academy video that you can publish to YouTube. That'll make a QR code and you can put it right on the kid's homework that when there's a bunch of problems like that. So they're working through, I've taken a picture of a worksheet on an iPad. Does that make sense? So now that problem is now on the iPad, and the kid works through it with a stylus as they talk about the steps that they're doing. Right now I'm modeling that, 
But I can do that and I can make a, I can put a QR code of that right next to the kid's homework problem that has the problem similar to it. They can see that video and then work through it. Let's take the example of one-fourth. I'm thinking a semantic example might be one hoof of a horse. I'll start by looking at how much it takes to make a hole. Well, in terms of hoofs, it takes four to make a hole. I'm going to circle that in the fraction as a denominator, in the division problem as the divisor, and in this percentage estimation tree as 100%. And I'm going to, head, going to go ahead and put a four in each of those circles, because it takes four to make a hole. Now I'm going to look at all the parts that I have. Perhaps this horse has one red hoof, and we're going to represent that as a decimal equivalent. I'm going to head and put one inside this box here, 1.00, just like one dollar. And I'm going to extend the decimal point right up to the quotient. Now I have a division problem. How many fours can I get out of 10? Well, I can get two. Two times four is eight. Subtract, I'll get two. Bring down this zero. How many fours can I get out of 20? Well, exactly five. So 25 hundredths. If you think about it, one fourth equals 25 hundredths, or written as a decimal, decimal point 25, which is read 25 hundredths. So it makes sense. Let's look at it as a percentage. All right, it takes a four to make 100% of the horse. It's hard to think of one fourth as a percentage until you break it down into benchmarks. Well, 50% or cutting that four in half would give you two hoofs. Well, 0% of the horse is zero. 10% of the hoof, would, of, the, of the horse's hoofs would be the original number divided by 10, so it would be four tenths. Now looking at these numbers between zero and four, what we need to do is figure out where this one is. Well, here's two, here's zero. Right in between zero and two would be one. If you look at how that would match up with the percentages, what's right in between 0% and 50%? And it's 25%. The way to do this procedurally is to take the decimal, 25 hundredths, move the decimal point two places to the right, and add the percent sign, and you'll get 25% equal to 25 hundredths, which is equal to one fourth. So the key part there is being able to estimate it first before you do the procedural bit. And if you have an easy graphic organizer that'll facilitate that, the kids will start to estimate and think and not just do a procedural thing, or use a calculator and get the wrong answer faster. So this is the same thing where they're doing a Basically, here's 100%, here's 50%, but doing it within their body, do you see? And you can see that video. I want to show you slope before I let you go. So slope used to be y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. Remember that horrible formula you had in ninth grade? I've made this so much simpler. All you have to do is put one, one point on top of the other and subtract them, and you have slope. So I'm going to show you that. You notice the graphic organizers of the, of the people saying, here's the X, and you notice which way I'm pointing, right? And then the Y going up and down. So the kids work through that on a big Cartesian plane where they see they have to go right or left first, and they plot themselves. So I just want to show you this quickly before we run out of time. So there's zero, 04, right? We get that plotted. Does that make sense? Zero, four. Now I'm going to do four, zero. And we don't go up any. So that's where that is, right? So we can see 
how far it is from the origin to the blue is four and same as the uh, the red. But if I'm trying to find that, to see the graphic organizer down there, I say draw in the right, the right angle, do an arrow, that's C. Make sure you define that. And so we're going to label that inside this Cartesian grid system. There's the C. If they don't get that in, they usually get it wrong. So then as they figure this out, A's four, these four don't know C. Plug it in, Pythagorean theorem, right? So we get to this point, and now we know 32 is worth C squared, and we need to be able to estimate a square root. Well, here's a great graphic organizer to do that. That's what C squared looks like. Well, each side is C, right? So here we got a square above it and a square below it. So you put those in. We want to find the square root of 32. The square above it is going to be 36, and the square root 6. The square below it is 25 and its square root's 5, yes? So what you got to do is the square root's got to be between the 5 and the 6. So it's 5 point something. So just estimate where the 32 is going to be on that. Well, it's a little bit close to the middle, but a little bit above it, right? There's right the split right between. And go ahead and do that on your calculator. You're going to get the same number. But here the kids can do it and estimate it. It's not that hard. Everything within perhaps 144 they can estimate. And slope, same deal. We're just going to find the differences and then make a fraction. Find the run, right? Four. Put that in there. You just subtract them. And the y, and the y it's going down, correct? It's going down four. You write that as a fraction. That's it. That's your slope. So much easier to translate. Here's how I'm going to end. Here's a real picture. See the blue line? What's that thing called? Let me give you a little hint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see how I just made a D out of it? Okay. So how about this? Do you see what I mean? Do you see the plus signs in the corner? And that's all the way around? You just have that same diameter three times and a little bit more. Well, that ends up being pi. But you see how you can put it out there with a picture if they're drawing this and all of a sudden it gets internalized. All right. So we're out of time. I want to make sure that you know that you can come stop me anytime. I'm usually down at the landmark table. Thank you so much for coming. Make sure you do the QR code thing. And uh, welcome to Florida, I guess. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>